Today on the show, does North Korea claim to have discovered real live unicorns? Find out when you and I play a little game of North Korea, fact or fiction. Thanks for hanging out. Welcome to the future where the glass is half full and you'll need new glasses, where you'll be jumping from conclusions. The past is a no, and a new future is born. Never before in history has so much meant so little to so many. AD on the radio. Oh, I agree with you on pretty much everything, AD, but I got to call you out on this one. You are wrong. It is basically the uh, content of several emails I've gotten over the past couple of days with regard to Lil' Kim and uh, the Cheeto-in-Chief meeting and me saying, "Uh, I think it's okay for them to talk. All sorts of people hit me up going, "Uh, what next? Do we cozy up to Iran? What are our allies going to make of this? Are we capitulating to terrorists? They hold a nuke to our heads and we just give them what they want to, a seat at the table? I 100% understand all of these sentiments but i'm going to tell you why i'm going to tell you why it's a good idea that these two people talk in my opinion first and foremost though i think we have to deal with a much more pressing question another one that i've gotten a lot of email about and if you want to hit me up you can do so on twitter and instagram at adsxe or you can email me ad at iheartradio.com but the more pre- the more pressing question i've gotten about Kim Jong is, well, did he bring his own toilet to his summit with Trump? North Korean leader Kim Jong-un reportedly brought his own portable toilet to Singapore for his meeting with President Trump. This was the rumor that was floating around. Now, first and foremost, let me ask you this. If you had the power to do literally anything you wanted to do, if you were a dictator with absolute control over your situation, would you have with you at all times a personal toilet? I think I would take the seat. I think I could deal with it. Nah, no, you know what? I would probably, if I could, I would probably want my own toilet wherever I went. I am uh, never going to be in that position, but it must be nice. Uh, and and yes, yes, this is the uh, this is the dealio. He did bring his own toilet. A former North Korean official said that's not actually that uncommon, saying, quote, rather than using a public restroom, the leader of North Korea has a personal toilet that follows him around when he travels. <laughs> so, yeah, this is apparently a North Korean tradition. There's not enough food to go around, but we get a traveling toilet. Yeah, ours is not to question why. Ours is just to look back and go, boy, people are different on other, in other parts of the world, I suppose. The leaders, and I quote, this is a direct quote, from a former North Korean official, quote, the leader's excretions contain information about his his health status so they can't be left behind. And you know what? I guess I can sort of understand that. I mean, if you're being uber paranoid about this sort of thing, if you're the type of person, as Kim Jong-un is, that a lot of people would rather see not around, then I guess you want to... um I guess you want to be able to flush any evidence of your health and fitness level away and know that no one else is going to, revoltingly enough, get to go through it. But yes, and I quote again, the leader's excretions contain information about his health status so they cannot be left behind. Or as a South Korean report put it, he thinks doing this will, quote, deny determined sewer divers insights into his tools. (laughs) Again, direct quote. One of those things that could not could not possibly make up. Now, as far as we know, as far as we know, Donald Trump was a little bit more utilitarian <laughs> in his approach to the bathroom situation in Singapore. When Donald had to take a Trump, <laughs> he made do with the local Singaporean toilets. <laughs> Although, <laughs> uh, you know... I wouldn't be surprised if Donald Trump had his own possibly golden toilet that he took places with him. And here's the thing. In Donald Trump's case, it might not necessarily be to protect his presidential excretions. It could be because he's a notorious germaphobe. And uh, that is pretty much 
exactly the reason that I would choose to travel with my own my own toilet if I was able to. If I suddenly become empowered as a dictator of my own personal country and I'm offered several ridiculous options for my own personal health, safety, and hygiene, I think my own personal toilet that travels with me everywhere I go that nobody else gets to use, that would be a thing that I would want. There you go. Politics making strange bedfellows. Kim Jong-un and me, we have something in common. I too would have my own personal toilet if I was offered this. Okay. Now that we've cleared up the rumor, and uh, yeah, I actually got a lot of email about this, you and I are going to talk about why in just a little bit. I think it's a good idea. I, I understand that a lot of people felt like, I said, we were capitulating to a terrorist. He held a nuke to our head and we gave him a seat at the table, something that every other president has out of a sense of honor, duty, dignity, and respect for human rights denied him and people like him in North Korea for years. But there's a reason I think it's always a good idea to talk. Real radio, 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 radio. One hundred four point one. Where the left and right come together for fundamental truths. AD on the radio on Twitter at ADSXE. So my dad's a guy that spent a lot of his life helping people reach agreements, helping parties with fundamental disagreements come together in a way that was equitable for everybody. My father was a corporate oil lawyer and a telecommunications lawyer. My dad did some pretty outrageous stuff. He did oil deals in Russia during the height of the Cold War intense things. I mean, you and I have talked about this a little bit in the past, but my dad will tell you stories about going to Russia, trying to work out business deals and getting calls in the middle of the night from people going, you like to meet a nice Russian lady? No, no, thank you. No, thank you very much. I was like, why would they call you and do that, dad? And he's like, well, you know, it, probably a pretty good chance I was a KGB and they were attempting to uh, get me into a situation where they could blackmail me and make me a spy. I was like, that's intense. Like, why would you put yourself in that situation? He was like, it was really exciting. I was like, but you could have wound up. He was like, no, you just kind of knew who not to talk to. And, you know, you do the right thing and things will work out. You don't go to talk to a nice Russian lady. Uh, You stay in your hotel room and uh, you do the right thing. The other thing he told me about negotiating Cold War Russia, and we've definitely talked about this in the past on the show, but it's such an insane thing that, man, it's worth repeating again because, huh, He said that he went into a negotiation to do something in Russia. I don't know what the negotiation was all about, but he was there. And before going into the meeting, he walked into the bathroom to kind of freshen up, as one does in these situations. And he ran into one of his colleagues, one of his American colleagues, eating a half a pound of butter. And he's like, dude, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? And here's the thing. In Russia... At the time, and maybe still now, I don't know. In Russia, they had this sort of negotiation slash intimidation tactic where wherever you got to a point in the deal that you were working out of agreement, you celebrated by drinking vodka. And if you didn't take your vodka, you weren't a real man and the Russians wouldn't talk to you. And if you did drink the vodka, there's a pretty good chance you were going to get soused and make a poor decision. And they knew that. It was sort of like this negotiation slash intimidation tactic. And my dad's coworker didn't have much of a tolerance for vodka. So he was eating the half pound of butter to coat his stomach so that the vodka wouldn't get into his system until after they were done negotiating the deal. Insane, right? And he told me, he was like, the Russian people are great. They're really, really spirited, fun people. Uh, I had a great time over there, but there's something interesting about Russians, and that is in every situation with a Russian, there is a winner and a loser. It doesn't matter if you are having a conversation. It doesn't matter if you're going out to dinner. It doesn't matter if you're deciding to to watch on the television. It doesn't matter if you're negotiating a business deal. They are out to win, and they are out to make you lose. So it's a tough one for a diplomatic person. Someone that's trying to reach an agreement that's equitable for everybody when the other one wants to feel like they absolutely stuck it to you in Cold War Russia. 
pretty intense stuff. So my father, my father spent a lot of his life as a bit of an expert negotiator. And after he finished that, he sort of went and did human rights work. Pretty intense stuff where people's lives and sort of civilizations were on the line. And the one thing my dad told me when I was was a kid, and I'm not very good. I'm not very good at taking this piece of advice. I keep it in the back of my mind because I know it to be true. But when push comes to shove, I have a hard time remembering it. I'm going to have a hard time putting it into action. It's something I got to get better at. But my father told me once, when I first started, when I had my first negotiation, I'm a teenager, my band gets its first record deal, we're working out our first record deal, and there's some stuff I want. And I was like, Dad, what do I do in these situations? You know, you've negotiated a bunch of stuff. What do I do? And he was like, remember all of this, all of this, this massive conglomerate of a record label that you're dealing with this multi-million dollar deal that's being worked out. It seems like big faceless corporations and tons of money. And that's an illusion. Nothing is ever the way it seems. It's just about people. It's all about human relationships. And I have a hard time remembering that because to me, life is a meritocracy. To me, you should be able to work hard, get ahead And that should be the end of that. But I always kind of forget the human element. Maybe it's because I'm a bit of a cold, unfeeling, calculating robot of a human being when it comes to the workplace. I believe in doing the right thing, and I believe in getting results, and I believe that should be rewarded. And I'm always befuddled when I see, uh, you've seen it, your place of business, radio is no different, broadcasting is no different, media is no different, the arts are no different. You see people that kind of suck at what they do go in places that they shouldn't go after not getting results. And you're like, how is this possible? How is this happening? And then you see, oh, these people are really well liked. (laughs) That shouldn't matter, but it does. It does. And my father said this to me. My father said all of these things. These massive negotiations, whether it was you with your record label and millions of dollars on the line, whether it was me with a bunch of Russians that were determined to get me drunk and make me lose and be the loser of this negotiation, all of this, all of this, it doesn't matter. It just comes down to human relationships, one-on-one human relationships. And I wonder if you've ever seen this, I wonder if, I wonder if you've ever seen this in action, probably in your place of work, right? I'll give you a great example, great example of this guy I knew who should have been fired his second week of work, but because of human relationships, he managed to stick around. How does this principle affect the fate of the world? You probably see where I'm going with it, but we're going to go there still next. For more stimulation and less irritation, 9 out of 10 doctors choose KPRC AM 950. Houston's more stimulating talk radio. Don't get the blues, get all the news, we mean all of you. Guys out there in Radio Land. All aboard! He's back. AD on the radio. Give it up, yeah. Give it up, yeah. Bring this on, bring this on. Come on, come on. So like I was saying to you, my dad, my dad was a great source of advice when it came to negotiation. My father negotiated in some pretty intense situations, you know, oil deals in Cold War Russia back in the day. And he's got some great stories about that kind of thing. And, you know, it's interesting. (laughs) My father was always able to, my father was always able to when I was a kid and now that I'm an adult, sort of like address my principles and find a reasonably good historical precedent to compare me to that would make me give some serious thought to my actions. And, you know, I've always loved the work of John Mulaney. I've always loved the comedy of John Mulaney. And here's the thing, the the whole time though, I didn't realize that, and maybe this is why I like him, but it sounds like John Mulaney's dad and mine were kind of similar. Have a listen to this. My dad never hit us. My dad is a lawyer and he was a debate team champion. So he would pick us apart psychologically. 
one time I was at the dinner table when I was like six, because I had to be. <laughs> My dad goes, how was school today? I said, it was good, but someone pushed Tyler off the seesaw. And where were you? I was over on the bench. And what did you do? Nothing, I was over on the bench. <laughs> but you saw what happened. Yeah, because I was over on the bench. <laughs> so you saw what happened and you did nothing. Yeah, because I was sitting over on the bench. <laughs> Let me ask you this. In Nazi Germany, when people saw what the Nazis were doing and they did nothing, were those good people? Oh, no, those are bad people. You got to stop the Nazis. But you saw what they were doing to Tyler and you did nothing because I was over on the bench. And then my dad said, just explain to me this. How are you better than a Nazi? And <laughs> then my mom said, I made a salad with craisins. And the conversation ended. So my dad never compared me to a Nazi for my principles, but like he did it when I was a kid. He sort of found a good historical precedent for like, hey, this is why we don't do this, because that's how Nazi Germany happens. And then <laughs> I remember well into adulthood, he does this sort of thing. I think I said something on Facebook. 2015. Picture it. New York Mets. Los Angeles Dodgers. Chase Utley does the dirtiest of dirty slides into second base, breaking second baseman Ruben Tejada's leg. The Cobra Kai, the Cobra Kai attitude toward second base and sliding into it. Sweep the leg, no mercy. The two dirtiest slides that have ever been seen in baseball. One was by a Los Angeles Dodger called Chase Utley. One was by a Philadelphia Philly called Chase Utley. And when this happened... When the leg-breaking Ruben Tejada Chase Utley slide into second base happened, I let fly on Facebook with my disapproval and my hopefulness that Chase Utley would have his leg broken in retribution in some sort of way. As one does during a sporting event. It's such a tense sporting event when your team is on its way to the World Series. And something like this happens. And my dad kind of picked up on that. And he was like, well, that's sort of like eye for an eye thinking that led to Nazi Germany or something like that. I'm like, dad, I'm just trying to be a sports fan, I'm not trying to be reasonable. This is sports. This is the Mets. And they're making it to the World Series. But I suppose in principle, you're right. But like I said, my dad gave me great advice, which I can take sometimes. I know it. It's in the back of my mind. I know it's good advice. I know it's the right way to think, but I just have this knee-jerk reaction where I believe that life is a meritocracy. I believe in taking people and things at face value. I believe in showing up, doing your job, working hard, and you'll get results that way. And there is some truth to that, but I guess it makes me a bit of an unfeeling robot that I don't take into account the human side of things. I don't get any sort of... I don't believe in relationship building around the workplace. You know, team building exercises. Ugh, really? On my day off? Thank you, but no. Really? I could be at the office finishing off the things I got to finish. I have enough hours in the day. I have enough things that qualify as work. I don't need to go out and pretend to like you people in these situations. We work, we work fine together, and that's it. Do we get results? Good. Now, reward me and let me go home. Everybody else wants to bro down and be friends. And it's just, it's not, it's not my thing. And it's not because I don't like people. It's not because I don't like my coworkers. It's just, I get very little time and I, I just want to take what little of it that I have to myself and go live face down in my living room carpet and look up occasionally to watch the Mets lose. That's what I like to do during my time off. And that's a mistake. That is a mistake. My father told me years and years ago when I was doing my first ever negotiation when I was like 16 years old. And I wasn't really doing the negotiation, but there was some stuff that I wanted. And I wanted to explain these things to my lawyer. And we were in this massive negotiation. I was just a little kid, really, when you think about it. But we were in a negotiation with a massive multinational conglomerate and there were millions of dollars at stake and you know careers were on the line on both ends of things and i was just this punk rock kid in a band but there was some stuff i felt very strongly about in the contract and i was like dad what do i do you you negotiate for a living and my dad told me never forget that all of this all of this is just based on human relationships one-on-one -on -one human relationships you get along with someone, you share experience with someone, you're in the trenches with someone that's going to build something with someone. And there's more of a chance of you getting the things that you want when you have a relationship with someone. And I've never been into, 
I don't know, smarmy schmoozing. And he's like, no, no, it's not about that. It's about building something real and tangible. And that takes time. And that's a luxury I don't really have. But I know it in the back of my mind. I know this is a real thing. Give you a perfect example. I know somebody that works at a tech company. And I was talking to them about a new hire that they had. I was like, they seem like a nice guy. Yeah, they do seem like a nice guy, don't they? Yeah. They probably won't last very long. Why? Well, they're just not, they're not really taken to the gig. They're not very good at what they do. All the sort of hallmarks of achievement in this line of work, they're, they're, they're just not living up to expectations. So they're probably not going to cut it. And they're probably going to get put on an action plan. They're probably not going to live up to the action plan. They're probably going to get fired. And so, you know, check in a little while later. Hey, that guy, that that new hire that you were going to fire, did you wind up firing him? No. No. He's kind of like, he sort of gets along with everybody. He makes everybody laugh. He's sort of good for the mix. And he's trying. And, you know, he says he's trying. And and he's doing a little better, not much. But people just kind of like having him around. People like having him around. He's good for the vibe at the office. So he's uh, he's getting a stay of execution because he's likable. And I was like, that seems so wrong. That seems so contradictory to everything that I've ever thought was the right way to go through life in business. But then I lose sight of the importance of human relationships. Here's this guy keeping a job that he's really sort of not necessarily qualified to do. A few months later, check in again. Do you wind up firing that guy eventually? No, actually, you know what? It took him a really, really long time. But he turned things around, and now we kept him, and now we're really stoked by the fact that we kept him. And it's all working out. And he continues to be really good for the office. People really like him. They get along with him. And he's become great to work with, and he's really gotten results. It took him a while to get his thing together, but he's gotten his thing together, and now he's one of our best. Now, if I'd been that guy's boss, I might have missed out on something really good because I would have been like, nah, two weeks in, month in, month and a half in, not cutting it, time to cut our losses and get with something else or someone else. The idea that this guy had a jovial, uplifting attitude that made people around the office smile would have meant nothing, nothing at all to me. But that's where I suppose I'm wrong a lot of the time. I forget about the human relationships. And it's something I'm trying to be better at. Trying to, and something I'm trying to do better at. That's in practice. In theory, I know it works and I know it's right. Relationships, human relationships are important. We talk about it all the time on the show. The one thing, the one thing that prejudice cannot stand up to is contact. It's much harder to hate someone when you know them. It's much harder to hate someone when they're part of your daily life. I grew up in the Northeast. The vast majority of my family is from the Northeast. And in the Northeast, most people, you could swing the proverbial cat and you could hit a liberal Democrat. It's sort of the thing. And then I spent like 10 years of my life in Texas. And in Texas, it's the polar opposite. Everybody is highly Republican. Sometimes Republican doesn't even come close to being good enough. Establishment Republicans, rhinos, Republicans in name only. No way. We're much more right wing than that. We're you know, true Republicans or whatever the hell the case may be. There's a lot more of that than there are Democratic or left leaning types. And. In these two places, I noticed that it's really easy for people to stay very fixed and rigid in their definition of people of opposing political beliefs because, well, they never have to have their preconceived notion of them shattered because they walk out into the street and meet a million people just like them that think the same thing as them. It's a bit of an echo chamber in one way or another on the Northeast and in the South and Texas. And then I started spending a lot of my time in San Diego for work for one of the stations I'm on. And I noticed something. I noticed something really kind of cool. I noticed that, well, um, there's a bunch of very right-wing types. 
because of the military presence in San Diego, plunked down right in the middle of hippy dippy tofu sprout eating tree hugging California. And you know what? Those people get along. They integrate a little bit better. They're a little bit more sensible in their ideas of politics and that they don't necessarily believe that anybody that voted differently from them is an evil a-hole that hates America and is looking to burn it all down. When someone believes something that's different from you, but they're your neighbor and you maybe loan them your lawnmower or they loaned you their lawnmower or they might happen to be really hot and you might be totally into them, it's more difficult to stay angry at them. Contact breaks down prejudice. Contact breaks down hate. And that's why I'm always sort of in favor of people talking. I don't think anything bad can come from people talking. Now, like I said, I got a lot of emails saying, how could you possibly say it's an okay thing for Donald Trump and Kim Jong to meet? This makes us look unbelievably weak. They essentially threaten us with a nuke and we just kowtow to their demand for a seat at the table. I mean, here's what we know. It started with them walking out and shaking hands, a firm handshake, firm handshake, but Trump didn't yank it like he sometimes does. Kim Jong-un spoke English and said, nice to meet you, Mr. President. They talked a little, they posed for some photos, and they also had, in addition to a bunch of photo ops, an agreement that they hammered out and, and signed. Now, before any of this, Trump got on Twitter and went after his critics for saying the meeting was a bad idea. He used the phrase haters and losers, which is just freaking bananas. Here we are, an historic meeting about to happen between a president of these United States of America and a leader of North Korea, something that has never once in the history of our nation taken place. And uh, it's prefaced by the words haters and losers, which is just freaking ridiculous, obviously. But the bottom line is, it could be years before we know if the meeting with Kim Jong-un accomplished anything major. Some people are comparing it to when Nixon opened up relations with China, saying that Trump could win the Nobel Peace Prize for it. Others say it just gave Kim Jong-un what he wants, which is to be legitimized and elevated as a world leader, and he got the meeting by threatening us with nukes. And that sets a dangerous precedent. It makes our allies un uneasy with us, and it makes the rest of the world think, oh, what we got to do? All we got to do to get our way with Donald Trump is to point a missile at America, and he'll hop right over for a photo op. And I get that. I get that criticism. I absolutely understand that criticism. But for me, when I'm trying to think about what it is that makes this world go round, you think armies, you think enormous nations you think in these vast intangible terms but really it comes down to human one-on-one -on -one relationships and that's something that we can't lose sight of sometimes you just know you're done you're longing for that shining sun you walk these streets most every day you wait until you get washed away AD on the radio. Uh, you know, before we finish off the Donald Trump, Kim Jong Un conversation, I got to play you something. Oh, so cool. If you're like me, one of your favorite musical inventions of the last 20 or so years 
is the mashup. I can't remember when people started doing mashups, but with the advancement of digital recording technology, it's gotten significantly easier to do this stuff recently. And so you're kind of only limited by your creativity. And a guy called a guy called Bill McClintock is creative as hell when it comes to these things. Check this out. He found a way to mash up Wham! and Slayer. Mm-hmm. Yep. Careless Whisper in the Abyss. Pretty amazing, right? Like I said, the idea of the mashup is one of the niftiest things to come out in music in the last 20 or so years. And you know, one of the things I think I like the most about the mashup, this really speaks to our point that we were talking about earlier. The mashup is something that, well, I am a black and white rule follower when it comes to work. Not necessarily in the way that I view life in the world. I mean, you and I talk about this a lot. Life isn't black and white. In politics, people would love to simplify things and say that there is one way that's right and one way that's wrong and one party that's right and one party that's wrong and never the twain shall meet. And Life is not that simple. We built this entire show around the idea of the fact that life isn't black and white. There's a lot of gray. And in the gray is where you most often find the truth. So we hang out there a lot on this show. But when it comes to work, when it comes to rules, I, I think that one thing that I wish that I would have picked up on earlier is that you don't necessarily have to follow all the rules completely. And the mashup, the mashup is a great example of that. There's some great pieces of art that can never be released commercially because, well, this guy doesn't necessarily have the permission of Wham! and Slayer to do this. Another great example of it is this dude, Brian Joseph Burton. Are you familiar with Brian Joseph Burton? Brian Joseph Burton is better known as DJ Danger Mouse. He's one of the biggest producers of all time. He produced the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He's won Grammys as producer of the year. He's worked with the Black Keys. He's worked with Beck. He's been part of Gnarls Barkley. He's had four or five different bands. He has sold tens of millions of records with as a producer and as an artist. It's very impressive stuff. But you know what it all came from? It all came from something that legally, technically, doesn't exist, has never been released commercially, and could not be released commercially. Speaking of Grey, he made something called the Grey Album. He made a name for himself in 2004 when he, in an underground sort of way, non-commercially, you couldn't go into a store and buy it. You could find it in little corners of the internet. You might be able to get a CD burned of it. He couldn't make a penny off of it, but what it did for his reputation was incredible. He released the Grey Album, which was a labor of love. It was vocal performances from Jay-Z's Black Album mashed up with instrumentals from the Beatles' White Album. Mm Mm-hmm. The Grey Album. And it is an artistic triumph that, for legal reasons, technically doesn't really exist. And he created it. And it allowed him because of what it did to his reputation and his notoriety to go on to be one of the biggest record producers of all time. So it's easy, I guess, to lose sight sometimes of what's possible to be, of what it's possible to do if you are, well, willing to think a little bit outside the box. Me and my thinking, if I had the idea to mash up the Beatles white album with Jay-Z's black album back when I was doing music, I would have been like, nah, you can never release it. It's not legal. Why would I waste my time with that? But he went ahead and did it. And look where it took him. It's impressive, impressive stuff. And like I said, it sort of speaks to the point that we were talking about earlier. The idea of Donald Trump meeting with Kim Jong-un. A lot of people, a lot of people, understandably very uneasy about it. Although, what's interesting is the country is kind of split on this one. As with all things Trump, you would assume that there was a 50-50 split. Not so much. 50% of America is totally behind it. Less people think it's going to lead to North Korea doing away with their nukes. But generally speaking, Donald Trump's approval level among Democrats is incredibly low, as you would imagine. But on this one, a little bit better. Not much. I think 
he usually has sort of like a 1% approval rating for everything that he does among Democrats. And in this case, it's sort of like 12, 13, 14, or 15%, somewhere around there. So not really high, but a huge jump up from what it usually is. So a lot of people in favor of him talking, but the people who are against him talking to Kim Jong-un, very against him talking to Kim Jong-un, and have written me to let me know in no uncertain terms that I'm wrong about it. But here's the thing. Here's the bottom line. Is Kim Jong-un essentially a Bond villain? Yes. Has he done horrible, egregious, terrible human rights violation things to the people in his country? Absolutely, 100%. Should we kowtow to his demands? In no way, shape, or form should we ever. But what with life not being as simple as we think it is? What with life being something that is based on human relationships? You might think it's about armies and nukes and all of these things. In many ways, it is. It's these massive abstract concepts of war and acceptable losses and invasions and armies and nations and united nations and allies and all of the above. These big, huge, insurmountably large concepts that have to deal with global world peace or global war. But ultimately, ultimately, and it's a nerve-wracking thing that it's Donald Trump, even his supporters would agree, would agree that he's not of the coolest disposition, and Kim Jong-un, who is a freaking wackadoo Bond villain. Ultimately, it's about the two of them talking. It's about people talking. It's about being in the trenches together, building a bit of a relationship. And maybe it all goes to hell, and maybe we all go down in fiery blazes. But at this point, when fire and fury was being threatened by both sides of the equation, before we actually got to it, you will never get me to say that before a button was pressed, that apparently works very well, it was a bad idea to try talking first. Leave the stimulation to the professionals. Everyone is so smart. KBRC, more stimulating talk radio. There's something happening here, and you should know what it is. (laughs) The dumbing up of America. Now, more AD on the radio. So as you and I discussed earlier, Kim Jong-un brought his own toilet to Singapore because well, he doesn't want to leave his excrement behind because that would be something that people could get into and analyze his health problems. He doesn't want any information, fecal or otherwise, about him in the hands of his enemies. Yeah. Anyways, according to South Korean reports, he thinks that doing this will deny determined sewer divers insights into the Supreme Leader's stools. Yeah. Story. State media within North Korea had previously claimed that Kim Jong Il and Kim Il Sung did not defecate. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a claim. No, no, they, they don't. With uh, such an unbelievably rich history of making uh, slightly less than believable claims, I figured we would see if you can pick out their claimed truths versus the ridiculous claims that we came up with. Mm-hmm. Yes. We'll play a game of North Korea fact or fiction before we get out of here today. Right now, though, let's you and I take a look at the events of today in our segment, My Witness News. What is going on in the world? Well, apparently what is going on in the world is that Roseanne Barr is still on the ballot for Emmy consideration. Although at this point, I think she's about as much chance of winning that as an NAACP image award. So I wouldn't hold her breath. A woman claims that Jamie Foxx slapped her in the face with his uh, most manly piece of apparatus, if you know what I mean. And I think you do at a private party in Las Vegas in 2002. Yeah, this is kind of an interesting one i got to be careful how I talk about this on the radio, but a woman went to the Las Vegas police this past week, just gone by, and made an allegation against Jamie Foxx, claiming that he sexually assaulted her 16 years ago. The woman said that she was at a party with Jamie in 2002, and he wanted her to uh, perform relations on him. She declined, and Jamie responded by, quote, slapping her in the face with it. Yeah, Jamie denies it. He said the story is, quote, absurd and that he'll send his lawyers after her for filing a false report. Now, here is the part that is a bit of a thinker. If the woman, even if the woman is telling the truth, 
Jamie Foxx is in the clear because the statute of limitations has run out. How freaking ridiculous is that? If you found out that your sister had been sexually assaulted by a guy in the year 2002, would that somehow make it okay that it had been 16 years? No, absolutely not. Would you still want to rend him limb from limb? Absolutely. Would you do everything that you could to punish him in whatever way that you could? Yeah. Freaking totally. 2002. Limp Biscuit were out. We were wearing Jinko jeans. But we still remember it. It's still real to us. It's not like it didn't happen. As much as we'd like to forget Limp Biscuit and Jinko jeans, those things are a very real part of our history that cannot go away. And so would sexual assault be. So why all of a sudden do you get to... Well, it's not all of a sudden. It's a statute of limitations that's been in place for a while. But why do you get to make a sexual assault go away after 16 years? If he did it, and I'm not saying that he did, but if he did do it, then why the hell would he get a pass because it happened that amount of time ago? I don't know, and I don't think it makes sense, and I think it's something that needs to be seriously re-examined. Anyways... Yes, a woman claims that Jamie Foxx slapped her in the face with his most manly of apparatus at a private party in Las Vegas in 2002. So apparently what happens in Vegas does not stay in Vegas. It is revealed in a police report 16 years later. The World Cup will return to the U.S. in the year 2026. Yeah, the World Cup is coming back to the U.S. in the year 2026. And Americans everywhere are already are already yawning with anticipation. <laughs> Soccer is a really interesting game. Here's the thing about soccer. You can't really walk away from it. It's not built around the commercial break the way a lot of American sports are. It's constant and never-ending action. Ah, I like it, but that's because I grew up in England. And yeah, I'm aware that uh, for many people, it might be a scotch dull. Some friends of mine, some friends of mine, refer to it as kickball, and well, I have a hard time. I have a hard time disagreeing with that. Hey, you know what today is? Today is President Trump's seventy second birthday. Yeah, today is President Trump's seventy second birthday. If you really want to surprise him, have Melania jump out of a cake. <laughs> what does this mean? No, this means that these days he makes porn porn stars spank him with a copy of AARP the magazine means the special counsel Robert Mueller is sending him a dozen long stem subpoenas. In other Donald Trump news, President Trump called the press America's biggest enemy. Yeah, Donald Trump said that the press is America's biggest enemy. <laughs> to which childhood obesity replied, hold my beer. A ballot initiative in California could divide it, divide it into three separate states. This is a very interesting one. As a guy that spent a significant portion of my professional life in California, I can honestly say that the idea of it being three step, separate states might not be that bad of an idea. I mean, it's radical. It's really out there thinking. It's something that I don't think will happen. But it's something that, when you look at it, would sort of make sense. I mean, there's Northern California, Southern California, and Kale Smoothie Stan, I suppose. But the divide in things like income, the divide in thinking, in needs from one part of California to another are so radically different that it does make sense. It does make perfect sense that when it comes to a state's rights type of situation, that the various regions of California be divided up. Anyways, that's what I think of that. Oh, only 375 people showed up to an orgy in Las Vegas, so their uh, attempt to break the world orgy record fell short. As, I would imagine, did the women's expectations when they saw the guys who showed up. On the bright side, they probably saved a ton on wet wipes. Uh, Green Giant released a list of the most popular vegetables in all 50 states. I would imagine it's french fries. A new study says that you can get food poisoning from your kitchen towels. Oh, okay. Maybe don't eat your kitchen towels. You'll be fine. <laughs> a North Carolina teacher named Kayla Sprinkles was erected, arrested for having sex with a student. Yeah, a North Carolina teacher with the name Kayla Sprinkles was arrested for having sex with a student. Authorities, I think, first suspected that she was a sexual deviant after learning that her name was Kayla Sprinkles. Also, if anyone's ever done any real research into this, we certainly haven't been given the conclusive results. But if you've seen the 
increasingly regular stories of high school teachers that have sex with students and get caught. The vast majority of them are female, and the vast majority of them are, let's be real here, remarkably attractive, like really, really sort of handsome women, if you will. And it, it, there has to be, there's got to, at some stage in the game, be a common thread that runs through the psyche of the type of person that would do this. They're all like really attractive and probably don't have much difficulty in the dating world. And they choose to do these things with their students, which are hideously illegal and absolutely morally and ethically wrong. But yeah, it's very, very strange. Kayla Sprinkles, pretty easy on the eyes. And I'm not saying that in a voyeuristic, creepy way. I'm saying that in sort of like a sociologically interested way in that every single one of these teachers that gets popped for having sex with their students is good looking and there's got to be something to it. Anyways, can you imagine, speaking of all things school related, can you imagine how different your high school experience would have been? If you could have gotten pot at school, from your school, sounds insane, but this is now apparently the norm. It's happening in Colorado, where they are first to the party with all pot-related things, but Colorado school nurses, get this, can now give out medicinal marijuana. Not feeling so well, got something going on, need a bit of a pick-me-up for a painkiller or something of that nature, then medicinal marijuana is something that can be distributed to students by nurses. You can get pot from your school, like I said. How insane would that be? How much would that change your high school experience if that had been the case when you were a kid? In a related story, the number of Colorado 11th graders with glaucoma has apparently gone up 750% in the last 48 hours. All right, I think it's about the time that you and I play a little game of North Korea fact or fiction. Let's go ahead and do this, shall we? See, the deal is Kim Jong-un brought his own toilet to Singapore because he doesn't want to leave his uh, number two behind. He doesn't want to leave any stinky evidence behind him when he leaves. According to South Korean reports, he thinks that doing this will, quote, deny determined, and this is a direct quote, will deny determined sewer divers insights into the Supreme Leader's stools. Yes. Interestingly enough, state media within North Korea had previously claimed that Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung, his predecessors, well, they didn't need to take a toilet with them wherever they went. For the very simple reason that they, they did not defecate. Yeah, they, they, they were genetic anomalies. They were supreme beings that did not trouble themselves with the filthy business of making stinky. So, with such an unbelievably rich history of making kind of ridiculous claims, I thought it would be a real treat for you and I to see if you can pick out their claimed truths versus the ridiculous claims that I came up with today. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, are, are you ready? I think we, uh, I think we could use some appropriate North Korean esque music for this, don't you? Let's, uh, let's have a listen to the Korean national anthem. Ah, there we go. So, true or false? North Korea can cure AIDS and cancer. Well, that's allegedly true. Yeah, North Korea can apparently cure AIDS and cancer. According to the folks in North Korea, that's a fact. You see how this game works? I'm going to throw this out. You decide whether or not this is actually a claim that's been made by North Korea. All right, try this one. Kim Jong-un could drive by the age of three. Yes, he was driving by the age of three. That, again, according to the folks of North Korea, is a fact. Kim Jong-un is the first human ever to dunk on a 20-foot rim. That's not false. Not even the people in North Korea are buying into that one. Uh, North Korean researchers found unicorns. Yes, unicorns are real, and we know this because North Korean researchers found them. Well, that apparently is totally true. Wow. The Pyongyang Zoo must be a, an interesting place. <laughs> are we almost out of Anthem? Oh, no. We're, we're still good. We're still good with the Anthem. Should we listen to the version with lyrics? No, probably not. It would probably be difficult to concentrate on our game. I've never heard the anthem before. I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting this. Hmm. Look at him. Challenging my preconceived notions of what a North Korean anthem should sound like. Let's listen to it again as we continue our game. Alright. Uh, 
Fact or fiction? We said that they discovered the unicorns, right? Yes, they did. Kim Jong-un can cut his own hair by simply thinking really hard. <laughs> well, that one's, that one's false. All UFO videos are really North Korean aircraft, and they were meant to be seen. It's a little gag that they've been playing on the rest of the world. Well, that's fiction. Uh, North Korea invented the hamburger in the year 2000. Well, that's apparently completely and totally true. Uh, Kim Jong-un has never sneezed. No, no. I mean, if he's not above pooping, then sneezing, uh, that's small potatoes. Kim Jong-il made 11 holes in one. Well, that is allegedly totally true. Kim Jong-un can talk with all animals. Nah, not so much. The country created hangover-free alcohol. That is apparently true. And finally, Kim Jong-il was born under a double rainbow. Well, that is naturally absolutely a fact. Have yourself a good one. If you need anything between now and the next time, hit me up. At ADSXE is where you can tweet me. You can find me at ADSXE on Instagram as well. Or email me, ad at iHeartRadio.com. Later.